just want to say again, thanks so much to everyone for being here. I was just in Charleston uh, with my family last weekend and we visited the Angel Oak. I had this wonderful experience of seeing so many people just visiting a tree and it made me so, so happy and I'm having that feeling again. So thank you for that. Yeah. I'm here to tell you about the forest. I don't mean to sound presumptuous. The forest doesn't need me to tell you about it. We've spent too long believing we hold the power in this relationship, and we all know what that's done. No, I'm here, to I'm here because I need to tell you about my forest, the one whose branches grow out of my center and whose roots dig deep into this world, and how my forest and the forest, like the capital F forest, how we are the same. I read that trees brains, though of course that's not the right word, look at me forcing a tree into my narrow understanding, but that their brains are the roots spreading out, dropping in, meeting the mycelium and flicking out messages and nutrients through it to other trees. Essentially, if we were trees, we'd all be doing a permanent headstand. Picture that. Imagine how different yoga would look. Here's what else I know about trees. That the chanterelles grow under the white oaks each summer at the house where I grew up. And that the earth there is a carpet of moss, joyful and full, a tapestry of green. One year, I tried to convince my mother not to pave it and turn it into extra parking spaces. And finally, she understood why. That a wand carved from black walnut means that you have walked the poison path and found comfort in it. And a wand carved from oak means that you have the strength of the green lady with you always. That the weeping willow who grows by and holds the water cures deep old sorrows. And that one reason for her name comes from the way rain looks when it, when it, the way rain looks like tears when it falls from her leaves. That she has held me when it seems there is no way out of my darkness and helped me to take my next steps. That each year a wood thrush nests in the woods behind my house and every morning and evening while it's here, I am the lucky recipient of its gifts. That its hidden song is disappearing from our world and that it and all things are worth saving. That it is not even our right to say what's worth saving. This summer, several birds built, yet, built nests in our yard. We'd peek into the hanging ferns to see baby house finches screaming and hungry. A month later, they fledged. We saw them perched and focused on a nearby power line as Mama taught them to fly. One night after our house finches had flown, after one of many torrential rains that month, I heard cries in the semi-dark, saw soft, small movements against the wet grass. A sparrow's nest with four hatchlings had been obliterated by the storm, sending the inhabitants toppling from their precarious position in the bush by our kitchen window. They were mewling things, and their parents swooped by horrified as I contemplated what to do. Several internet searches later, I placed the babies carefully in a homemade nest tucked into a small cardboard box filled with dried yarrow and a soft hand towel. I had to leave it on the ground. It was too unwieldy for the bush, and I didn't want to take them too far away. I just didn't want them to die. For the next few days, the parents flew by the window, and one or two of the chicks would raise their tiny heads. Then one morning, after a night of hearing the coyotes sing up in the dark hills, they were gone. They were still too young to fly. How much of the forest is still nature red of tooth and claw, and how much is now our fault? I felt the loss and my own responsibility in it. A few days later, I watched a mama bear with two broken hind legs try to cross the interstate, her cubs peering expectantly from the side of the road. People had stopped their cars, pulling off onto the shoulder. To do what? I wasn't that brave, had no idea how I would do anything but fall apart if I, felt, if I pulled over. The next week, I was in the hospital, hemorrhaging because my pregnancy was in the wrong place. Dust-colored pigeons sat outside my window, which looked out over the building, endless, itself a kind of terrible forest, filled with its own strange creatures. 
Death links us to death and to the turning world, even when we hide behind our doors, our curtains pulled tight against the inevitable. But still, it's there. I felt it as I lay in that bed, inhaled and exhaled it between sobs until it could be quiet and still. Like those birds and that bear, life was lost before it even really had a chance. We all would have been good parents. Here's another thing I know about the forest. White pines are for peace and hemlock's wisdom. Oak protects and birch helps to forgive. I know this because the trees told me. I don't know why they still bother to talk to us, but they do. There's a way of walking in the woods that keeps time with the slowness of the earth. I try to do it as often as I can, but I usually only find my way into that still easy way of being paradoxically when I'm on the hunt for new spring violets, for stinging nettle to take home and wilt so that it releases its gentle medicine, for the morels that pop up where the old lumber mill used to be. I have visions of creating a feast worthy of the fairy folk, where we'll all drink honeysuckle tea out of acorn tops in a blue-green forest grove, and the world won't be the same when I step back into it. It feels easier to leave sometimes, to throw my hands up and go deeper into the woods, or maybe to take a little boat and travel down the river, stopping at an island just big enough for me and setting up there for the rest of my days like Pippi Longstocking, waiting on the fairies to come for tea. But fairies are tricksy things, and their spell would take me so far away, I'd never be able to return. And even a broken home is still a home, isn't it? A few years ago, I went camping with a friend in Acadia National Park on the wild, rocky Maine coast. We hiked all day up what seemed to me to be a sheer cliff face as I hauled myself up, dragging myself across the iron rings and ropes that some far braver souls had placed there for people like us, drilling iron into a mountain for no other reason than to help us see the startling view from the pinnacle. It was terrifying. I feigned bravery as I skirted along the scree, feeling my own smallness articulated with every step, my frailness as my ankles twisted this way and that, as my arms shook from the effort to sidle across giant boulders and heave atop ledges. At the top was the burnt orange and gold of the forest, and at its edge, the gray sea stretching onward to the end of the world. That night, we sat by a fire we built with birch strip starters, gently pulling the paper outer bark and being careful not to take too much. And we drank cheap red wine and hot chocolate and swapped stories until the chill of the autumn evening slipped into our bones in spite of the flames. And we crawled away to sleep, drawing blankets tight and keeping wool caps on, sturdy against the cold. Things shuffled around our tent to remind us that they had been there all along. In the morning, we made bacon and eggs, and they tasted that glorious way that only a camp stove and a cold night can make things taste, like gas and fire and grit. Then we packed up, folding tents and rolling sleeping bags, already stepping out of the rhythm with that sacred place. Another friend calls it forest time, that slipping into the slower cadence of growing and dying things and remembering your place there, the way that being becomes so easy. As we shed our onion skin, a replanting takes place and we recognize ourselves in the darting shape of the buck, the buzz of flies, the black eye of the woodpecker as he glides by. Days in the forest stretch on, each new discovery, a salamander, brilliant orange and half hidden under a rock, a little village of inky cap mushrooms glistening black and silver in the morning dew, a spider's web the size of a face usually spied after walking straight into it, the white bones of a deer washed clean by bugs and thyme, a caddisfly submerged and sparkling in a clear rivulet of water spilling down from the mountain, each one giving way to the next, creating the net of a world that holds us too. And if the days are spacious, the nights are even longer, filled with the whisperings of things to each other and to the velvet dark, a love song perpetually unfolding. There are no answers in this story, no paths forward. Grief takes us to strange places, and beauty does too. Once you step off of the trail, you're lost, but perhaps that's what we all need, to be lost to find our way back to ourselves, and to discover there has never been a trail at all but the one we've made before this moment, and this moment, and this one. What song do you sing to the forest, and what does it sing back? Thank you.